Good morning, everyone, and welcome to 10 Years Hence. I'm James O'Rourke, a professor of management at the University of Notre Dame, and I'll be your host for this series. Today, we'll take up the topic of disinformation, China, and Beijing's broader global media influence. So as we begin, a reminder to those of you who are online, both here and around the world, that at the bottom of your toolbar, you will see a Q&A button. If you click that, you'll have an opportunity to keystroke a question you may have for our guest today. When the moment seems appropriate, uh, my research assistants will help gather those up and we'll pass those along to our speaker. Our speaker today is Sarah Cook, Research Director for China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan at Freedom House in Washington, D.C. She directs the China Media Bulletin, a monthly digest in both English and Mandarin, providing news and analysis on media freedom developments related to China. Ms. Cook is also the author of several Asian country reports for Freedom House, as well as special reports about China. Her comments and writing have appeared on CNN, the Wall Street Journal, Foreign Policy, and publications of the U.S. Congressional Executive Commission on China. Before joining Freedom House, Ms. Cook co-edited the English translation of A China More Just, a memoir by prominent rights attorney Gao Zhisheng, and was twice a delegate to the United Nations Human Rights Commission meeting in Geneva for an NGO working on religious freedom in China. She received a BA in International Relations from Pomona College in California, and as a Marshall Scholar, completed master's degrees in politics and international law at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. So let me welcome you, Sarah. Good to have you with us. My pleasure. It's really nice to be here. Good. So I assume that um, you've been busy lately there. China is in the news. And I do not, I don't assume uh, that the, uh, the aims of the regime uh, or their ideals have changed dramatically, even with a new change in administration in this country. Uh, no, and I think one of the things that we see is, I think a lot of the policy response, both in the United States and elsewhere, um, is a reaction to things that are changing in China domestically, as well as China's behavior internationally. Good, good. Well, I know you have a number of thoughts for us, so I'll turn this over to you. And then at uh, some time when you think it's appropriate, we'll gather up questions and we'll resume the conversation. All right, sounds good. Well, hello, everybody. And I, I know you can see me, I can't see you. That's one of the um, elements of the, the Zoom webinar setup. Um, I'm really pleased to be here and to have an opportunity to share some of my observations and some of the research that others have done that helps inform the work that my colleagues and I do at Freedom House. Um, I thought I'd start a little bit talking about actually some of the trends within China um, that we've seen because I think it really helps inform uh, what both Beijing does internationally, but also um, you know, kind of how we look at what's happening uh, internationally. Then I'll talk about the broader toolbox of global media influence that the Chinese Communist Party and its proxies deploy. Um, and then I'll dive in a bit more detail on the disinformation part of the puzzle, because it is really only one part of the puzzle. Um, towards the end, I'll talk a little bit about some of the response we've seen and what we might expect, you know, in the coming years, since this is a series um, called 10 Years Hence. Um, and then I really look forward to our conversation and, and to hearing your questions and seeing um, how, how I might be able to, to answer and address what might be on your mind. Um, so for those of you who, I don't know how many are familiar, Freedom House, um, we're a human rights organization based in the United States, um, been around for I think almost 80 years now, um, uh, was founded in 1941, um, have a pretty long, um, uh, very interesting kind of bipartisan history. We were founded by Eleanor Roosevelt and Wendell Wilkie, who had just lost the election to FDR. Um, and really the Freedom House's mission is to support freedom and democracy around the world. And we do this by research, which is what I do, advocacy and trying to inform policymaking, both in the United States and elsewhere. 
and programmatic activity to really work and support activists and human rights defenders, trained journalists and the like in different parts of the world. So one of the things we're best known for, and I think some of you who study political science have probably come across, um, are the reports we do where we give scores to countries on their level of freedom. Um, and one of the ones that we do is called Freedom in the World, and it looks at political rights and civil liberties in every country in the world. And I think for myself, I actually just recently went back and looked more closely at how China's scores have evolved over the last decade, 10 to 12 years. Um, and it's, it's pretty interesting, and it really reinforced kind of more of a gut sense um, that, that I had in terms of and the trends that I've seen looking just strictly at China. Um, you know, from a more qualitative perspective. And that is that um, the Chinese Communist Party's rule in China has gotten more authoritarian. It's gotten more repressive. The targets of repression have intensified. The tactics of repression have intensified. Um, what's, you know, on the wrong side of the red lines has expanded quite dramatically, um, especially since um, started around 2008, but has accelerated since 2012, particularly under leader the leadership of Xi Jinping. And so in freedom in the world, we give countries scores on the love, you know, from a rigorous, pretty rigorous methodology and review um, from zero to 100. And China back in 2012 scored a 17. So China's long been in the not free category. So 17 out of 100, you know, for those of you who get scores on tests is not a score you would want to see. Um, and demonstrates the degree to which China was, you know, quite close politically um, but there was still, you know, some space. Most of those scores are on the civil liberties side rather than the political rights side. But what we've seen is that over the last decade, as I said, space has closed. And so now China receives a nine out of 100. So if you think about it, it's an already deeply repressive and authoritarian regime that has been, and a country ruled by that regime, where now the amount of freedom available is almost half of what it was a decade ago, which was already a pretty low starting point. And I think when we look, we have another index that looks at internet freedom. And um, similarly, China, back when we started that, we only started that in around 2009. Um, in 2011, China had a score of around a 17. And now it's a score of 10. And so I, and they're in that period of time, there were kind of some ups and downs, particularly when some of the social media sites, um, even though they're inside China, were able to provide outlet for public conversation um, and breaking news sharing, exposing corruption and the like. So I, th I think that really gives a sense of how much China has changed domestically um, in terms of particularly media and political rights and, and freedom of information. Um, and I think even that doesn't fully capture the qualitative differences, the way in which so many things that were tolerated or even permissible previously are now not only off limits, but people are sent off to concentration, to, 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 to re-education camps, or are face long prison terms, um, or no, don't only just have like a post deleted, but have their entire social media account, which they use not only to communicate with friends and family, but to make purchases because of the way uh, digital currency and so forth work in China and are so prevalent right now. So I think that's one of the things that is really helpful to keep in mind when we're talking about what's happening externally to China. I think the other thing internally has been the role of the Communist Party. That as much as the Communist Party has been the one party system for a long time, and the Communist Party exercises significant control over the state and the political system and the legal system in China um, and regulators, uh, the, the, the reach of the party and the, the, the way in which it actually more directly controls day-to-day -day work and more have agencies that actually and state media that are directly under the supervision of the Chinese Communist Party uh, has intensified, particularly since 2018. So I think that's one starting point. I think the other thing, and then one of the things that we've looked at at Freedom House is of course the, the global impact of this growing authoritarianism within China, and um, you know, especially as it becomes a, a global power. And we've looked at, at there are think, three particular areas in, in terms of the kind of information space. Um, that are worth noting. One is the export of digital authoritarianism, so kind of specific export, including of surveillance equipment, um, particular types of legislation that you see being adopted in other countries. Um, the other is transnational repression, and those are the ways in which the regime will pursue, including in terms of physical attacks, members of the diaspora, people in the exile who have fled China 
and end up being subject to pretty serious forms of human rights violations, even when they've left and are in, in, in democratic or especially in less democratic countries. And thirdly, the main topic of our discussion today is Beijing's global media influence. And so I think when we look at the way in which China and the Chinese Communist Party are able to influence media and especially news content, because that's really what we at Freedom House are especially focused on, um, has expanded dramatically over the last decade in particular. Um, and I think what we have now is a reality where hundreds of millions of people around the world and in multiple languages are consuming news and information that has been influenced by the Chinese Communist Party, by its narratives, by its directions, but often without being aware of the party state connection or of those origins because of the various ways in which that connection is obfuscated or the content is quote laundered, uh, which is a term sometimes people use in terms of um, it actually being disseminated by an entity where the direct link to the Communist Party or even to China is not evident. And this has been deliberate. Um, I mean, even before under Xi Jinping's predecessor, Hu Jintao, um, who was head of the, the Chinese Communist Party and, 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 and the system in China, um, he already had invested in 2011, uh, no, 2009, some $6 billion to expand the reach of Chinese state media. And when I have gone through and looked at some of the filings that we can see in terms of the minimal transparency, say surrounding the operations of particular Chinese state media publications here in the United States, you really see a huge jump between it's like almost like tenth fold um, from like about a million dollars a year to like 10 or $12 million a year between 2009 and 2012. That was before Xi Jinping even rose to power. And then it's pretty much continued steadily. And that's just one publication in one country. So I think in terms of just the sheer investment of resources is one element to keep in mind. I think the other is that this really is a global issue. Um, I mean, for the Chinese Communist Party and Chinese state media, no market is too small. Um, if you look at some of the reports I've written, one that I wrote recently um, called Beijing's Global Megaphone, and you can just Google that and find it on Freedom House's website. We have examples there from Papua New Guinea. <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's really, you know, ranging from, you know, as well as from Brazil, you know, from Argentina, um, from Kenya, from South Africa, from Thailand, from Sri Lanka. Um, from the United States, from Germany. Um, so it really is a global issue. And I think as we think about this, even as it, when I get to the kind of the disinformation and social media element, that's something that we definitely see. Um, so I, I think one of the, the other things that we try to do in terms of thinking about and talking about this global media influence, um, one is there's, um, you know, there's certain things that are just public diplomacy, and it's certainly the right of China and Chinese state media to, quote, tell China's story to the world um, and, and relay the perspectives, you know, of the government and, and in some ways indirectly of, of the people, though a lot of voices are, are squeezed out, um, domestic voices from China. Um, but I think what we really try to, you know, and what's concerning is really trying to identify what's called what Australian officials have coined the three C's. The places where it's covert, it's coercive, and it's corrupting. And so I think there's actually a lot of that. And I think that's part of what distinguishes, in some cases, you know, why uh, groups like Freedom House are especially concerned about some of these activities emerging from China or from other authoritarian regimes, and how it may be different, you know, from some of the activities from more democratic and politically open regimes. Though in some cases there can be covert or coercive elements there. And there, that's also a matter of concern, of course. But it's really much more systemic and systematic when you're talking about a regime like China's that is so deeply authoritarian at home. So one of the things in terms of wrapping our mind around this massive global system of billions of dollars and um, hundreds of countries um, is actually thinking about the tactics and the footprint from the perspective of um, a toolbox. And there's really four components of it, of which one is information and I'll turn to that in, in a bit to, in, in, in more depth. So I think if you look at it in terms of the four baskets, one is propaganda and the, the efforts to really push particular narratives and content from the party state to global audiences. And some of that is relatively transparent. It's that you flip, you know, you turn your TV to, China, to CGTN, China Global um, Television Network, which is the state, the, the international arm of the state broadcaster. And 
you know, and, or you open China Daily and you have some sense or idea that this is a Chinese daily media. Um, but even there, and especially when we get to the realm of social media, there's definitely efforts by these outlets to obfuscate that connection. So at one point I looked at Facebook and was looking at, and these are accounts that have tens of millions of followers. So people are actually following, you know, Chinese state media and especially from the global South, but not only. Um, and when you look at the taglines that they use to self-describe their accounts, they absolutely try to hide essentially the party state connection. So the People's Daily, which is the mouthpiece of the Chinese Communist Party and is really known as very strongly aligned with the party and the leadership, even as a way of people reading the tea leaves in China, so to speak, um, you know, within China, internationally, the, it just says the largest newspaper in China. China Daily, the English language state-run media, largest English newspaper in China. Xinhua News, the state news agency, uh, the tagline was something like 24 hour news from China. Nothing really indicating that Xinhua News is again, very tightly controlled, directly controlled by the Chinese Communist Party's propaganda department, used deliberately as the source of the authoritative news in China to the point that local media there get directives on this and that topic, you can only use Xinhua News. But internationally it's framed as just, you know, a news agency like AFP or Reuters, uh, which are private and obviously, you know, independent. So, so I think there's that element of obfuscation. But then there's various different ways in which this content gets insinuated into local media. Um, one is called barring the boat to reach the sea. And that's where there's just paid placements or other arrangements, content sharing arrangements, so that people don't have to go pick up China Daily because not many people are going to. But if you open the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or a newspaper in Senegal or India or South Africa, you will see the China Daily. Um, you will see an insert of the China Daily that is about China news and has their content. And it might say in the corner, paid supplement. More rarely does it say, somebody will say paid supplement from the People's Republic, um, the, the China Daily from China or, or People's Republic of China. Very rarely is the tagline, this is clearly a state affiliated or state owned news outlet. Then you get into things that obfuscate it more. Some of the ways in which journalists or media owners are, 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 are attempted to be co-opted um, to, to, to kind of and gain certain kind of economic interests to um, be more inclined to report positively about China and to use specific talking points and narratives. In other cases, it's co-productions. Um, so those are some of the ways in which you see this content being insinuated and reaching so many people who may not be aware that it's actually coming from the Chinese government and the Communist Party. A second, the flip side of propaganda is censorship. And I think that's where you really see the sharper edge of uh, China's sharp power um, in terms of the suppression of unfavorable information and also obstructions um, of journalists or outlets that are critical of the Chinese government. And you definitely see this in the Chinese language space but I think increasingly we're seeing it in the in local mainstream media. You see journalists in Sweden, in Russia, and I think there's a cartoonist in Ghana who get um, emails or calls from the Chinese and the local Chinese embassy or consulate trying to intimidate and pressure them with regards to an article that they had published. Um, you see examples of advertisers being pressured in different countries or in locations like um, Hong Kong, which is part of China, but has been up until now much, much more, much freer, um, you know, not to uh, advertise in particular outlets. Um, you see various forms of cyber attacks, sometimes physical attacks. So various forms of incentives that on the flip side of the propaganda is trying to suppress critical coverage, not only of what the Chinese government is doing um, inside China, the people in China, um, but in terms of say human rights violations and the like, but also with regards to Chinese investment abroad. Um, and, and to activities that are happening in the local space and trying to reduce critical coverage of that. Um, the third thing is gaining, having, gaining control over key nodes in the information flow in other countries. And that is usually entails Chinese technology firms with close ties to the Chinese government building or acquiring content dissemination platforms in other countries. We've seen this a lot in parts of Africa uh, with regard to the transition from analog to digital television, where there's a, a Chinese company that's been very successful at that at, at, at leading that transition in a way that is like pretty technologically innovative, but where we also start to see content implications for that 
because the most affordable and therefore the most widespread package um, contains local news outlets and Chinese state media. And more independent outlets or competitors like CNN or BBC, BBC World, um, are much more expensive. Um, I think the other thing, place we see this for China is in social media apps. So WeChat, for example, is ubiquitous in China, um, but is a private company. It's owned by Tencent. It's owned by a private company, Tencent, but has um, had to um, uh, really collaborate very closely to implement the government's surveillance and censorship priorities, including uh, you know turning over information of people who that were shared in private groups and people end up getting sentenced to prison for it. Um, so that app is now used widely in the Chinese diaspora and increasingly, um, you know, in countries like the Philippines, in Thailand, in Myanmar, um, by just, you know, people, um, uh, ordinary, you know, non-Chinese speaking, other non-Chinese speaking um, uh, members of those, of those countries. Um, and, you know, that has, um, one of the things we've seen, especially in the Chinese diaspora, is that that power has been used to censor, to censor certain voices, to keep certain independent media off the platform, to limit Chinese activists and, um, and members of, of victims of human rights violations from sharing their story, to actually, in some cases, restrict the ability of elected officials in places like the US and Canada and Australia from communicating openly with their Chinese constituents because on certain topics like Hong Kong, um, or, or, or I forget what one of some of the other examples were, um, uh, Huawei, um, that, that those kinds of um, communications uh, were actually censored by WeChat. Um, and so I think those are three things to keep in mind. The fourth pillar uh, is disinformation. And in the Chinese context, it's really a pretty new part of the toolbox. And I would say arguably not the most impactful considering everything I've just, I've just relayed. Um, definitely China is behind Russia uh, in terms of the level of sophistication. Um, and I think the goals of the different regimes are, are, are different. And I'm happy to talk about that if people are, are interested in terms of the broader goals. Um, but when, you know, but, you know, but a few years ago when kind of the whole issue of disinformation and fake accounts and social media really came to the fore after the elections in the US in 2016, uh, you know, I'd be on panels with people who were talking about what Russia was doing. I was like, yeah, no, China doesn't do that. They influence the media in all of these other kinds of ways. But that's really changed, and particularly since 2017. I think we really started to only be aware of it um, in about late 2018, early 2019. The first real example of uh, Chinese state-linked actors, you know, engaging in disinformation campaigns um, with, was with regard to local elections in Taiwan in November 2018. And I think when I talk about disinformation, I think it's, you know, contrasted, say, from some of these other forms of media influence, like propaganda. I think the difference is, one, that there's a certain purposeful dissemination of misleading and sometimes provenly false content. But I think the other much a stronger element is this act, element of in, inauthentic activity on global social media platforms. Now, in the China case, these platforms are pretty much all blocked in China. And I'll get to that in a little bit in terms of why, you know, even when it's hard to point back to the state specifically, it seems that it's quite clear that there's somebody in the party state apparatus that's engaging in this activity. Um, so I think that was really, it was kind of like late no, in November 2018. Then in 2019, as the protests began to take, you know, uh, against the extradition law in Hong Kong, gain momentum, we started to see it, it really started to see it being used much more widely. And we started to see the first announcements of takedown, say, by companies like Twitter and Facebook of these inauthentic networks that were sharing all kinds of content, demonizing the protesters, sharing false information about their use of, of violence when they had to use violence in particular circumstances. Um, and just, um, but then from those data takedowns, we actually learned that some of these tactics had already begun being used back in 2017 in some of these specific accounts. And that first phase was really targeted at Chinese activists, in some cases, and defaming and smearing the reputation of Chinese activists. Some people like Yang Jinli, who's a democracy activist and a former political prisoner um, who's based in Washington, DC. Uh, some people like Guo Wenguei, who's a defector kind of from the elite and a much more problematic figure, um, and, uh, but who the CCP, being an insider, very much dislikes. 
And, um, but also ones related to uh, Gui Min Hai, who's a, a bookseller who had been abducted from Thailand and taken back to China and sentenced to 10 years in prison. Um, protests within China that I guess were getting some attention in the Chinese diaspora. And so all of those initial campaigns uh, were in Chinese for the most part. Um, and were really targeted, and you can tell either at audiences in Taiwan or Hong Kong or the Chinese diaspora. And that pretty much, and the fact that, that now we've seen linguistic diversity and expansion, not only into English, but into languages like um, uh, Spanish, Serbian, Italian, languages that are also spoken, not just Spanish, which is spoken by many, many people around the world, but very kind of a small, relatively small number of people in, in particular countries. Um, fits a broader pattern in terms of the, me the evolution of media and foreign media influence uh, uh, tactics from, from, from China and, and from the CCP, because that's what we've seen generally, that the kinds of things that have been longstanding, especially since the, even since the 90s, among the Chinese diaspora co-optation of media owners, you know, uh, various forms of intimidation, um, purchasing of stakes to, to tweak the influence, the editorial direction. Um, all of that is things that we're now seeing in non-Chinese language media outside of China. And so I think this kind of mission creep that we've seen there, we see also in the disinformation space. I think one of the things from those early campaigns that was evident is that the China was still pretty, and China-linked actors were pretty new to this. So the impact was relatively limited. It was pretty clear that in some cases, this was, it was like there were bots, but it was, it was pretty ham-handed, like it wasn't, very nuanced. It wasn't very sophisticated. There were some, you know, successes at manipulating hashtags, or I think in Taiwan, it was actually, in, especially in those elections in 2018, much more effective, which is kind of where there was, why there was a wake-up call. Um, but one of the things, and this is a piece I've written recently, and I looked at going through some of the different reports that have analyzed more recent campaigns, um, is that uh, there's definitely an adaptation happening. There's persistence and there's adaptation. And so I think when we're thinking about the toolbox, this is a tactic that's here to stay. It wasn't just a one-off. And what we're seeing is more and more of these kinds of campaigns, broader targets, broader languages, um, uh, broader, um, uh, again, kind of like news topics and targets, uh, campaigns related to what's happening to, to Uyghurs in Xinjiang, uh, campaigns, um, you know, again, ongoing with regard to Hong Kong, um, but also expansion in terms of some of the topics and targets to in, engage more with domestic affairs of other countries. So trying to, and this is a much more kind of Kremlin-like uh, tool uh, tactic set of trying to sow divisions and amplify divisions within another society, including the United States, taking those fringe voices, taking certain hashtags, trying to bump them up, trying to get certain content to go viral um, in a way that is um, uh, much more impactful uh, and detrimental than what we saw in some of the earlier campaigns. So I think that's one of the things to keep in mind in terms of the trends in terms of this, in, this kind of China-linked disinformation space um, is this element of, of persistence and adaptation. Some of the reports and what's really interesting is that in some cases, you're seeing the same networks of accounts that have been taken down, but then kind of pop up again and get revived in one way or another, certain profiles and personas. So that's one of the things where, again, this points to, uh, I think, some kind of state direction and investment um, because, because of that uh, a degree of continuity. I think the other thing in terms of adaptation um, that you see from some of these more recent reports and campaigns um, is more sophistication. So that can take two, a couple of forms. One is the creation of persona accounts, which is definitely more of a tactic that Russia has used and Russian actors have used successfully that seem more real and that engage and seem to have a real person behind them. And it's not just a bunch of bots reposting the same content over and over again, which is what we've seen in the past. Um, and I think as a result of that, we're seeing more impact um, in terms of actual engagement by real users and real social media influencers retweeting or sharing content that has really been injected into um, the information ecosystem or amplified by these China-linked inauthentic accounts. Uh, the other is efforts to um, structure the networks in a way that will be more likely to escape identification and detection 
by the kind of algorithms that companies like Twitter or Facebook use um, to detect inauthentic activity. And so more autonomous cells, less interaction among them, various things like that that speak to an effort to adapt um, you know, and survive, um, survive longer. I think so, like I said, one of the things you see then is kind of increased efficacy in reaching real users. And so, for example, you see some linguistic expansion and some of the recent persona accounts that have been detected, um, for example, were really just speaking in Spanish. And actually one of those accounts was able to generate posts that were then shared by uh, Venezuelan ministers and other government accounts, um, by um, a journalist with a large social media following in, in, in Latin America, um, and a number of other social media influencers that again, end up reaching a, a wider, gain credibility and reach a wider array of, of users. But we've seen other examples of that in places like Pakistan, the United Kingdom, the Middle East, uh, um, uh, and, and other parts of, of Latin America and the United States. We've seen some examples, including one clip um, that seemed to indicate uh, election fraud that was later debunked. And it turned out that uh, it was kind of shared with one of the people who posted it, but then it got reposted by someone with, um, with a large um, audience and got like a million views had actually been kind of planted by two fake Chinese accounts. Um, and, and so I think one of the things that we see is also this intersection between the traditional media um, and the disinformation networks. And so one of the reports, a few of these reports really cite instances of journalists or local traditional media outlets in different countries um, unknowingly sharing disinformation from their own accounts or their news websites or even their television broadcasts that on top, you know, that had originated from uh, from these China linked disinformation networks. And again, it's quite global. Um, there were examples related to from Panama, from Greece, from India, from Argentina, from Finland, from New Zealand, and a local television station in Texas. I think when we look at kind of some of the elements of the structure of these campaigns and this question of attribution, which is of course very hard to get at when we're talking about disinformation, um, is that it's pretty clear that there are particular patterns of behavior indicating official backing. Um, and that relates to just the level of interaction with known official accounts of say Chinese diplomats or people from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or uh, social state media accounts on global social media networks where um, either they're reposting content from these networks, maybe unknowingly, maybe knowingly, but then vice versa where you have these networks trying to amplify uh, content and posts uh, from these official accounts. I think the other thing is that one of the reports analyzed the timing of when particular um, posts from a network, uh, a fa false network that was um, linked to China were posting from, and it matched working hours in China in terms of the time zone, even when the posts were appearing on the other part of the world, but also in terms of like particular, like vacation, I think it was, I can't remember, it was the Mid-Autumn Festival or some something like that, uh, that's not a holiday that, you know, outside of Asia or even mostly even in China um, is usually vacation time. Um, and so um, that reinforces the sense that there's some somebody with a job who's doing this during working hours. Um, and then I think lastly, in terms of both, and, and then there's of course the sophistication, but is the fact that these web, social media sites are blocked in China. And ordinary Chinese citizens, for the most part, are really restricted in how much they can engage on these platforms without facing retribution. And I think parallel to this kind of wolf warrior diplomacy presence we've seen more coming from China, from the official accounts, and these disinformation networks over the last two or three years, it's gotten harder and more dangerous for ordinary citizens in China to engage on Twitter or Facebook. And we've seen people get, you know, knocks on the door in the middle of the night, people be detained. In some cases, there have been people who have been sentenced to prison. So I think this question of whether there is at the very least some kind of official condoning of this behavior if not official support, which seems much more likely, um, you know, it's not just a network of, of ordinary Chinese netizens who are, who are able to so easily engage in this kind of behavior. I want to say a little bit about, about the content and then response, and then I want to make sure that we have plenty of time for, for questions and, and for discussion, because as you can see, it's a, it's a big topic. Um, so I think one is, Look, some of the content being shared in these inauthentic networks is pretty benign, but then some of it is really highly problematic. 
So on the some hand, you, you know, on the one hand, you see some of the content is what you usually expect, you know, from Chinese state media, like kind of the more fluff side of just promoting China, um, talking about a parade in Hubei province for, for COVID medics, um, other things that are talking about Xi Jinping's speeches or the Belt and Road Initiative. Again, also content that, you know, is particularly in the interest of kind of the official in China to promote internationally. And again, indicates, uh, I think strengthens the sense that this is somebody in the system who is, um, who is, who is engaging in this activity. Um, then you've got things that are kind of random, um, examples related to accidents affecting the United States, like lightning strikes or, or downed drones in Syria that maybe play into this narrative of kind of United States decline. And then others which are more along the lines of the first set of examples I had used, which are various efforts to attack and, and discredit perceived enemies of Beijing, like pro-democracy movement in Hong Kong um, or people like, like Guo Wenguai. But the more troubling content, which has really gained more um, prevalence recently, um, you know, could have a serious public health and political implications, especially when it builds on other material that might already be circulating in the target country's information ecosystem. So for example, we found po the, some of these reports and anal analysis found posts that would seek to exploit pre-existing narratives and enhance and engage that the local resonance. For example, false information about how Taiwan was responding to the pandemic, where Taiwan's actually been one of the most successful governments in responding to the pandemic. But they were raising, you know, I, I forget what the specific fake talking point was, but it was something that was clearly, clearly untrue. Videos questioning the safety of, of, the, of the Pfizer vaccine. And then one of the very persistent narratives has been a conspiracy theory that COVID-19 was developed at a US military facility and brought to Wuhan rather than that it had first been detected and seems to have emerged within China. But others, as I said before, there was examples related to US elections. There have been examples of campaigns related to Philippine, uh, can to, to Duterte and other, and then on the other hand, uh, opposition candidates in the Philippines. Um, there was another effort surrounding the January elections in Taiwan, but the Taiwanese government and civil society and technology companies were much better prepared to respond this time. And so they, um, and so they were actually able to deflect it and had very little impact on, on the election itself. Um, and, and so I think this, out, this question of like, what are the goals or how is this evolving? It, it's really notable that this isn't just the usual kind of talking points of what we usually think about in terms of content just related to China, trying to make China look better, trying to make the regime look better. I mean, there's lots of amazing things about China. Um, I think it's more a matter often in terms of the official narrative um, that it relates to making the regime or Xi Jinping personally or particular initiatives like the Belt and Road seem more benign than they may in fact be um, and to make the regime seem more positive as well as trying to debunk and counter um, you know, very well-documented information about human rights violations against people in Xinjiang, against people who practice Falun Gong in Tibet about what's happening in Hong Kong, um, all of that. But we're really seeing a shift to elements of that have nothing to do with China. Well, there's an element, a, a real effort to sow divisiveness within other societies and democracies and between them. So some of the campaigns, for example, one we saw in Serbia, definitely had this element of trying to separate and isolate Serbia further um, from the European Union um, in terms of like who's giving aid. We've seen a little bit of that in Italy as well. Um, some efforts, which are, some, again, some of these things are not particularly effective, but some network that tried to pretend that it was Taiwanese netizens, but they wrote in like simplified Chinese, which is what you use in China, not in Taiwan, and tried to make it seem that Taiwanese netizens were supporting California separatism, um, which is, I guess, something that some Iranian um, uh, fake networks also do as well. So you see, definitely see this element of trying to sow divisions among allies and within other countries. So I think what I wanted to, because I want to make sure we have time and I have a, a lot more I can say about the tactics, but also about the impact and response. I think what's been amazing in terms of the response is the greater awareness of this. And that so much of the information, the examples I was able to give you was because you see technology companies, civil society groups, um, uh, cybersecurity networks um, and in research institutions detecting this activity um, uh, downloading all this data and analyzing it uh, in a way that helps shed light on what's going on and help inform uh, responses. 
But even in terms of some of the other elements of Chinese media influence that I was raising before, we've really seen an awakening, both by governments, but also by civil society, to the very real threat that this can pose to not just to, you know, this question of, of um, you know, narratives, but real like actual media freedom, um, the media regulation system, even national sovereignty, even rule of law issues that some of these activities can really pose a threat to. And some really innovative and thoughtful and rigorous responses to that, um, you know, ranging from like, and in some cases it have proven quite effective. So Twitter started, for example, a little less than a year ago, labeling Chinese affiliated um, uh, accounts as a Chinese state media accounts as being Chinese state affiliated. And actually there was a study recently that found that engagement with those accounts dropped about 30% since that had happened. So the adding that extra layer of transparency that counters the efforts and more covert behavior, uh, you know, re really can have an impact. I think some of the other things that we've seen are legislation that enhances transparency around ownership, um, rulings by media regulators uh, when Chinese state media like CGTN have violated local broadcasting rules in terms of who owns them or in terms of the way in which they're reporting on certain issues like airing fault uh, forced confessions by people who are imprisoned in China um, that is very problematic. Um, so I think you really do see some, um, some thoughtful um, responses. You do also see more blunt policy instruments, which I think is where things get trickier and we have to really, I think as democracies and as democratic societies need to figure out the right answer because as much as a very real threat WeChat poses, not just in terms of surveillance, but in terms of censorship, in terms of disinformation and manipulation, because once you have a Chinese company with such close ties to the regime, you know, you know, being at the helm, they're the gatekeeper. They can decide how information is, is shared on their platform. It's a very real threat. Is blocking WeChat entirely the right answer? Probably not because of the way in which it, the, the, it's disproportionate in terms of the way in which it infringes on freedom of expression and information, especially for Chinese speaking communities in the United States. So I think that's where there's still a lot of work to be done to figure out how to protect and enhance resilience to these, the very problematic elements of these tactics without, um, without going too far. Um, one last thought, and I can talk more about this if people are interested in terms of where this is going. Clearly disinformation tactics on the part of the Chinese government are here to stay. And I think we're gonna see increasing, the increasing danger of that. Meanwhile, the broader toolbox is expanding as well. And while certain aspects of it have not been so impactful, and I think haven't always gained the improvements to China's reputation that the regime is hoping for, um, it, it, they still do pose a very real threat. And I think especially this element of the control over apps, over television, this content dissemination systems is one that there's a window now, where we need to kind of see how we navigate it because it's gonna be much harder to close and really open the doors to much greater and more serious forms of manipulation in the future. Um, but the flip side is, I think we could also be in a situation 10 years from now where, look, honestly, a lot of this increasing repression and aggressiveness, both domestically and internationally, comes from a place of insecurity of the Chinese Communist Party and of Xi Jinping personally, um, you know, and, yeah, you know, there's a lot of grassroots resistance in China. There's obviously precedents in Taiwan. And if Hong Kongers could have their way in Hong Kong of, you know, people who are ethnically Chinese, Chinese speaking, who are very capable of having rule of law and democracy and elections and, and very real, you know, a, a very real justice system and a free uh, media. And there are a lot of people in China who know that and who see that. And so I think you know, more optimistically, maybe 10 years from now, we will be looking at a very different regime in China, which again would really change the conversation in terms of, you know, the influence, um, you know, and this kind of, you know, interaction and engagement internationally. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there because I, I want to, I'm, I'm very eager to, to hear all of, all of your questions. Good. Well, thank you, Sarah. That was, uh, I thought, a wonderful overview of uh, what's currently happening. So let me, um, let me begin with a kind of lightning round, if I may. Um, I know that many, if not most, of our viewers and listeners have some level of sophistication on China, but not all. 
And of course, you don't always know what it is you don't know. So let's begin with some really big picture uh, issues. How big is China? Uh, how many time zones? How many people? How big is the economy? Uh, sure. Well, China has 1.4 billion people, I think it is now. So it's certainly the most populous country in the world. Um, I think what's incredible about China is how much it's changed relative to other parts of the world. So, um, and I'll say two things to that. One, in terms of the size of its economy. So I think I look back, I think 20 years ago, I forget, it was like the 10th or 12th largest economy. Now it's the second. Yeah. And so that economic cloud definitely plays a role in terms of some of these elements that I've been speaking about. I think the other is the size and the number of internet users. So again, 20 years ago, there were like maybe, I don't know, 15 or 20 million people who were using the internet in China. It's 900 million now. So, and even if you think about that from the perspective of a population of 1.4 billion, it's still only like 70%. So it's relatively low compared to a lot of developed economies. Um, but sheer number wise, that's three to almost three times the population of the United States. That's a huge number. And again, it's a huge market. Um, but I think is also that's also driven a lot of the domestic controls that we've seen um, because um, it's not just a small number of people who are engaging in the Internet. So if something goes viral, it's a lot of people in China and the All government right. is, is very nervous about that. Um, a couple of sort of geopolitical questions, maybe some uh, drawing on your State Department expertise. Who are China's allies? Who's on their side hoping they succeed? Uh, and very briefly, perhaps, why? Um, well, that's interesting. I mean, I think we definitely do see, um, you know, uh, a contingent and growing contingent of kind of modern authoritarian uh, regimes, uh, countries like Russia, countries like Iran. Um, I think you could put Vietnam there. I think in terms of allies, it's trickier because, and of course, there's North Korea. Um, uh, and, and I think in terms of if you look at communist countries, then you've got, you know, for example, you've got Cuba. But it's actually very tricky because part of the issue- well, Those China are really faces, dependencies, aren't they? Yeah, so that's what I mean. In terms of like actual real allies, there aren't many. And that's part of what makes mm -hmm. the Communist Party feel insecure. Because if you look throughout Asia, even other countries that are not particularly democratic are very wary of China because of the aggressiveness in the South China Sea, because of historical considerations, you know, actually, you know, countries like Vietnam, like, um, Thailand, you know, like, like Thailand, like the Philippines, they're very nervous. Um, again, even though they're not particularly democratic, of course, the democracies like, like Taiwan and South Korea and Japan are, are more nervous, sure. but there isn't really an alliance there. I think you do sometimes see elites um, in, in particular countries um, that, you know, in, in less democratic countries that will align with China, but sometimes it might be very issue specific. And so long as they want to learn from China and from the CCP's tactics to deploy against their own political opponents. But there isn't really a strong sense of allies. Um, and that yeah. increases the insecurity. In terms of alliances, I think that's one of the things in the last administration in this country that disappointed me the most. And it was that people who are traditionally American allies were simply pushed aside and, um, you know, we as a government were behaving as though this is a business deal rather than about our survival. So as I look at building our alliances out, I, I look then at Russia and I look at China and I see where China has gone and it's mostly sub-Saharan Africa and into Latin America. And I've got to tell you, I'm, while I'm no expert on all of this, I, I do read The Economist and I do, uh, I do try to stay informed on that. I look at the nations they've allied themselves with, and I say in each instance, they have really picked some losers. They have picked nations that are unstable, nations that are broke, nations that are driven by uh, autocratic leaders, demagogues. Um, so as an opinion question, can't they do better than that? Um, I, I think they can. And I think, again, it's a range. So one, I think one reason why no market is too small, no government is too autocratic, is actually UN votes are very important to China. Um, and they really use a lot of this kind of economic clout to gain votes at the UN to protect them, um, you know, from 
uh, having a special rapporteur on Xinjiang, for example. So that's one. Uh, two, um, I think you, again, it's not so much allies, but just very close relations with elites and with economic and political elites. And that's the case in Argentina and Brazil and in, you know, in South Africa and, and a lot of other countries that are definitely on the more democratic side. But I think one of the things when we think about the pushback is that it's not just something being driven from the United States. Um, I think the wariness surrounding a Chinese and the Chinese Communist Party is something that's been global. And Australia has been a key player in this in terms of recognizing its own vulnerabilities and responding to them. But again, right. as you know, I think in terms of just the reality is that just the way in which the Chinese Communist Party functions and, and carries out its policies, both domestically and internationally, um, are very unpalatable to a lot of people around the world. And I think that's one of the things where you see backlash. So if you look at opinion surveys, for example, in the first few years of this kind of state media push, um, public opinion, especially in the global south surrounding China and Xi Jinping personally, um, improved. But since 2015, it's actually declined quite a bit, including quite precipitously in some really important countries, places like Indonesia, places like Kenya, places like um, Nigeria, I think. So, you know, you have a situation where really important strategic countries for China uh, are definitely more wary of them, especially as, again, on the more freer end of the spectrum and are trying to figure out now how do they how do they maximize the benefits of economic engagement with China and minimize the risks surrounding both economic and political engagement uh, with the Chinese Communist Party? Well, uh, moving sort of to one big picture question, one smaller question about messaging. Um, I'm I'm interested in knowing what the goal is here. What's the end game? You don't put up a lot of money and a lot of assets and a big push against um let's say a media effort without a goal in mind so i'm a little puzzled uh internally it would seem to me that the leadership of the chinese communist party is worried about dissent they're worried about people who would you know like to live in a freer country um, so that's one set of messages what are their messages around the world? And do we get differences in Mandarin versus local languages, Spanish, English, um, Slavic languages? Um, what are they saying around the world and what's the goal there? Um, all right, so those are kind of two separate questions. I'll answer the goal one and then I can talk a bit about the narratives. Um, I think the goal fundamentally does still even internationally relate to uh, the CCP's concerns over its own political survival. And the overarching goal is to make the world safe for the Chinese Communist Party because they don't want sanctions being imposed on them, um, you know, and individual officials specifically, right? It means that they can't travel to, around the world. It means that they can't send their kids to Yale or Harvard, which a lot of them do. Xi Jinping's own daughter was at Harvard. They're not, I don't know that the US is going to sanction him, but I mean, I think, you know, that would be a situation where it, it creates very real problems for them to benefit you know, from, from their own system, as well as obviously reputational damage. So I think they definitely want to uh, fend off a not just criticism, but actual action um, and po particular policies that they seem as damaging their interests. Um, but I, I think there's a few different things. I think one is just um, to make the regime look benign and to make um, uh, China look positive, but again, a lot of it is very intertwined with the type of governance um, system and particular officials like Xi Jinping. The second is to suppress criticism, is to suppress investigative reporting, both about um, what is happening internally in China to Uyghurs, to Falun Gong practitioners, um, to human rights lawyers, but also, um, again, in terms of the darker side, in some cases, of their external engagement corruption, labor rights abuses, censorship. Uh, they want to suppress um, information about that and especially policies that might counter that. Um, and then I think thirdly relates to the Chinese diaspora and exile communities where there's an even tighter desire uh, to control, uh, to encourage less engagement with Taiwan and or, or more autonomy for Hong Kong. Um, 
And I think one of the things that's really interesting is that it's not just about hard news. They're very concerned about political commentary as well, which is something that sometimes surprised me. Well, it, it seems to me Jack Ma um, is a case in point. This is a very wealthy man, very innovative, and was regarded as kind of the Chinese version of Steve Jobs. Uh, he disappeared recently, mysteriously. He's made a couple of very cryptic public appearances, um, not saying much of anything, looking very much, um, if you're optimistic, like that little boy has been sent to his room. If you're not optimistic, he's looking like a prisoner of war. Um, is this a message to other Chinese entrepreneurs, uh, industrialists, not to step too far either side of the party line? Is he an object lesson? Um, yes, and it's actually part of a bigger trend in terms of moves against his company, against Alibaba, um, in terms of stopping um, an IPO, um, now making them have to divest in certain media holdings because Basically, the party, in addition to the comments that Jack Ma made himself that were critical of regulators, um, uh, there were also an instance where apparently they were able to influence a major social media platform in China to take down information about an affair that some executive had. And that really spooked the Chinese Communist Party because they realized that some of these tech companies can actually control public opinion mm -hmm. and guide it in a way that the CCP really wants to uh, We're worried to about the same itself. things, by the way, but we're not approaching them in the same way. Yes, yeah. And I mean, I think, um, but I think to your point about other, just in general, there's been an effort to rein in kind of the tech industry or other, I mean, I think the other thing is they've been very successful at co-opting. So for example, Tony Ma, the head of Tencent, which owns WeChat that I was talking about before, he's a member of the National People's Congress. That's the kind of rubber stamp parliament right. that you have in China. So I think there's been a lot of ways of roping people in. Jack Ma himself is a member of the Communist Party, which was not publicly known for a while, but now it is. And as soon as you're a member of the Communist Party, it's not just the laws in China. It's like this whole disciplinary system and itself this whole extra legal detention um, system, too, that the party runs to keep its own members in line that Jack Ma is subject to as well. Well, uh, interesting. And I know that um, a number of... Um... Uh, discussions have occurred in places such as the UK around um, uh, Huawei, and that really concerned information gathering uh, because Huawei manufactures hubs and routers, equipment that's used in telecommunication. And the idea, um, as the English see it, is that um, they tried to literally put all of their telecom system on Huawei equipment because it was so inexpensive. They came in at about half the price of everyone else. What a shock. How did that happen? Uh, how could they do that? How can they sell it so cheaply? They ask aloud um, and you know, don't seem to realize that Huawei is completely subsidized in their effort. But the idea was that all of this data would flew their, flow through their equipment and a side door would open and dump some of that information uh, into a bag to be sent off to Beijing. Um, is it your view that telecom may be one of the principal tools that the uh, CCP is using to advance its goals of global domination? Um. Yes, <laughs> I think, I do think, um, I mean, I think again, I think the CCP's goal of being able to dominate and influence the international scene um, is not an end in itself. I think it's a means to an end to ensuring the political security of the Communist Party domestically. So I think that's one thing to keep in mind. But I think the other thing with regards to the telecoms um, is look, there's commercial as well as, you know, espionage as well as political security dimensions to this. Mm. Um, so I think they want their companies to succeed because it's, you know, it brings in money and it helps the economy and so on and so forth. I think it does also allow them to have a real in into the telecommunication, um, you know, infrastructure of, of other countries. 
Um, and then I think, you know, when you look at some of the speech, and it's very much intentional. And I think one of the questions is like, how private are these private companies? You know, and beyond examples like Jack Ma being a member of the Communist Party or Tony Ma being um, no relation there, um, be a pony Ma, I mean, no, but no relation there, being a member of the National People's Congress. Um, you know, like if you look at party speeches about China's becoming a cyber superpower, they'll explicitly say that they are, uh, you know, pleased with and want to support the global expansion and influence of companies like Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, and Huawei. So it's not accidental that they've been given this kind of going out a green light. I think on the question of back doors and in the sense of Huawei, I think some of this is internal intelligence that we don't necessarily have are privy to, but there are definitely some documented examples of that type of backdoor. So for example, and I don't think it was Huawei, I don't know what Chinese company it was, but that built the African Union headquarters in Addis Ababa um, in Ethiopia. And all of a sudden, after a while, some of the technicians there discovered that between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m., all of the, the computers were relaying data back to Beijing, um, uh, to Shanghai, I think it was, to somewhere in China. And so then they changed it. But I think that was an exactly an example of seemingly Chinese government largesse actually having a very literal uh, backdoor in terms of gaining yeah. intelligence access. Talk to me about TikTok. That's a, an application owned by ByteDance, which is Chinese. Um, it is very popular, very popular in China. It has gotten very popular in this country. Um, in the tens of millions, uh, we're not yet up into the hundreds of millions of users, but it's easy to download, it's easy to use. And it is in many ways, if you look at the user figures there that are available, it is virtually addictive that people open the application a dozen, 15 times a day. They will spend up to 40 minutes total on the, uh, on the, the site. So you don't stand up an operation like TikTok without a reason. What are they gathering? How, how are they using the information about, about viewer habits, all of that, um, as, as a means for um, advancing their cause? Do we know? Um, that's a little harder to know. What I will say is a few things about why I think concerns not only about data access from a company like uh, TikTok and ByteDance, but also the content manipulation uh, are very legitimate and real concerns. So first of all, so, so ByteDance, um, in China, actually TikTok is a different name. It's Douyin, it's an app. And that app is heavily monitored and heavily censored. So you have a company that's all for political, on political, social, and religious. I mean, a lot of things like, you know, me, you know, as many political memes of our president that may circulate on TikTok here, you do not have political memes of Xi Jinping, you know, circulating on, on the Chinese, on the version in mm. China, right? And in fact, there was an opera singer who had an incredible likeness to Xi Jinping and somehow garnered a bunch of followers, even though he was just an opera singer, and his account kept getting shut down because of, of the political sensitivity of essentially uh, his face. So, um, so that's, and so that's a company that is actually doing that in China. It has the track record of doing that. Um, TikTok is a separate operation that's here in the United States and in international that unlike WeChat, where it's the same tool that's being used inside and outside China, they've separated, which I think is smart. Um, but again, the executives in China, like at some point he had to issue, the chief executive had to issue a public apology, like this really groveling apology over problematic content that had circulated on their app. The company also is very good at news aggregators. And that gets to this element of kind of the use of AI to figure out what people like to generate recommendations, that's really their bread and butter. And that's one of the reasons why TikTok is so addictive. So I think what you have with some of these tech companies is there is this, a real element of innovation, um, but there is also this element of gathering a lot of data, of having very murky moderation policies, of being able to really tweak the recommendations. So I think you know there have been a couple of rounds of leaked moderation policies from TikTok, 
one of which was very problematic, and I think they didn't change it, but was pretty explicit in that it was going to keep content about Hong Kong or Falun Gong or the Uyghurs, if not take it down, keep it lower ranking so it can't go viral, for example, right? I think they've wised up. But that real that that danger in terms of what they're able to amplify and reduce is, is very much there. And I think the question of you know where the data is stored or what it's being used for that um, I don't think there's very good evidence right now. But I think it is a, a legitimate concern, if only based on some of the things we actually do know more clearly about WeChat and what the way in which WeChat monitors and and censors content of users outside of the country. So there is a a precedent if, if from a different company. So two, two very big issues here. One is Hong Kong, the other Taiwan. Um, there have been a very concerning reports over the last couple of weeks um, that point in the direction of a, uh, a red Chinese army invasion of Taiwan. Now, um, I no longer get classified briefings. I'm current as of August of 1990. So most of what I know is of no real use, but I, I do read the papers and I, I do pay attention to that. I think this looks like saber rattling to um, tell the neighborhood and to tell the world, we're not only still here, we are very serious uh, in our long-term goal of reuniting our rightful possession of Taiwan. Um, so I'd like your reading of that, and I'd like your reading also of Hong Kong. That one looks to me like um, they're simply going to let those who've been offered British passports move on, and everyone who can't get a British passport is just going to have to toe the line and start behaving like they're Chinese rather than Hong Kongers. How do you read that? Um, uh, so on the Taiwan question, you know, I'm not a military uh, expert. It's not quite my area of expertise. I think there is an element of cyber rattling, but I think there is an element of, you know, a uh, very real pressure. Um, and I think we do see this again, even in the, in the disinformation space, in terms of the degree of targeting of, of, of Taiwan and trying to affect elections there in order to get um, uh, a presidential candidate or a mayoral candidate that's more friendly to China. Mm. So I think that latter part of this kind of cyber dimension is the more immediate threat probably to Taiwan. Um, I think the military threat is really a last resort. Um, but I also think, you know, to your point about we don't know what's in classified briefings, the timing of, you know, the Biden administration um, issuing a policy of enhanced engagement uh, with Taiwan is probably not accidental. And I think it's very good to see um, because I think that, you know, and I think there's been more European efforts from Europe to engage with Taiwan um, to help protect it. And I think, look, honestly, Taiwan, just like with COVID, it, it, the government, I think, got a lot of real street cred because- Could you um, say that again? That uh, During COVID, yeah. Taiwanese government, I think, got a lot of street cred internationally ah, street because cred. they were blocked out of the World Health Assembly. They actually tried, they had, because of the close, you know, communication and linguistic ties and professional ties, they had heard from doctors in Wuhan that there was some kind of SARS virus. And they actually tried in like late December to warn the World Health Organization and World Health, and they completely ignored it and they did not pass it on. And in the meantime, the doctors in China were punished and the cover up ensued and we end up with the global pandemic. So I think that was one element. I think the other is Taiwan domestically listened to its own people and very quickly closed travel to China, very quickly implemented a number of other uh, measures. And they've had some of the lowest, I mean, I think it's like less than a few hundred deaths. I mean, very low COVID rates. Life has been more or less back to normal for some time there. Um, it's really, it's really to the credit of, of the Taiwanese government. And I think that has, I think, even more, you know, emphasized how important, not just on the level of politics or military, but just your public health, how important it is to have Taiwan be given the international space and engagement uh, that it deserves as an economy and as a, a democracy um, in, in that part of the world. Um, and reliable, um communication media that you can yes. trust and believe. Yes, 
Yes, absolutely. And, you know, and innovation and supply chains that, uh, I mean, I mean, look, Taiwan on freedom, uh, Taiwan is, I think people don't recognize, it's an extremely democratic country. It scores higher than the United States on our freedom in the world index. Um, you know, it's got, it very takes human rights very seriously. Uh, it has very good quality elections. You know, there's the same kind of partisan media environment that you see in a lot of countries, but they're very serious and thoughtful people. And they really, because they emerge from martial law and their democracy is so young and they're, you know, facing this threat from this be authoritarian behemoth, um, they're, they're very cognizant to it and, and take it very seriously. And it's really, it's really incredible. Um, I think on Hong Kong, and I think what's happened in Hong Kong has, you know, most Taiwanese would prefer to just keep the status quo. They don't necessarily want independence. The kind of de facto independence that they, they have now is fine for them. They definitely do not want to be part of China. They definitely do not want a one country, two systems. Um, you know, and I think what's happened in Hong Kong over the last year in particular has pretty much gutted the one country, two systems. So it's not really much of a diplomatic point for China to make to Taiwan, to Taiwanese people. Um, I think in terms of Hong Kong, it's just, it's so dramatic and it's so tragic and it's so sad uh, what's happening. And I think we, we just, you know, in the last 24 hours, you know, veteran democracy, not just advocates, but like these are lawyers, these are you know, barristers and, and, and media owners who were basically facing between one and two years of prison now for organizing a peaceful protest that they, albeit the police did not give um, approval for, which in itself is problematic, that was attended by 1.7 million people. So these are the people who really represent Hong Kongers and they're now being sentenced to prison. I think we are gonna see more of an outflow of people who are able to get out uh, but I don't think that Hong Kongers are giving up. And I think what's incredible is that a lot of the information that we know about what's happening in Hong Kong is still coming from Hong Kongers. It's still coming from Hong Kong media. There's a lot of digital media outlets that haven't been co-opted. Um, and, um, and it's really to their credit. And I think we'll just have to see how long, how long that can last. Yeah. And I, you know, there's, there's a lot of discussion in the UK about you know, the colonial era. And uh, the bottom line is that uh, no matter where you're living now, the truth is someone else used to live there before you and um, it, the land was probably expropriated. So it's clear Hong Kong belonged to China. Um, the British had a 99 year lease on all of that. And the assumption was that if they became democratic, uh, China would never want to give that up. They would they would want to expand all of the commercialism, and that was what I used to read a lot about at the turn of this century. That China was going to become an authoritarian nation with capitalism as its base. It turns out now that it, it seems they are um, communist capitalists. That they really have transformed the ways to manufacture things, the ways to make money, and uh, tight central control seems to have benefited that. Um, and so as you look forward, um, you know, we, we talk about trying to analyze all of the disinformation or all of the content, but that's a rearview mirror, okay? We're looking backward there. What are the leading indicators that things are getting worse or that we should be alarmed about um, Chinese intentions either in Taiwan or perhaps further south in Indonesia, in, in Australia, uh, elsewhere. What, what signs or signals do you look for in the, in the information content that you see? So um, I think I think we look at the content, but I actually think it's more the mechanisms and the tactics that yields more information. So even if you look at the situation with Hong Kong, it's not just about Hong Kongers. Basically what China has done as it's gutted autonomy and, and freedoms in Hong Kong is tear up international agreements and treaties that it had committed to. And mm. including in Hong Kong, Hong Kong has actually ratified the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. China has not. 
including you know the dec the declarations and the, the signed the signed agreements with the United Kingdom. So I think in terms of even if we're talking about how do you engage China on issues like climate change, on on other topics, basically the message and what the Chinese Communist Party has said is like, sure, we'll sign the agreement now. We'll pro promise a certain amount of autonomy until 2047. But when push comes to shove and we decide that we a have enough power and clout that you can't really stop us. And two, that it's against our interest to allow that to continue. We don't care. We'll just tear up the agreements. And I think that's really important to keep in mind in terms of any kind of engagement or agreement, especially in situations where there's a temptation to sometimes be quiet on human rights issues or not push back on certain elements because of a desire to get China's cooperation in another realm, which is legitimately important. But I think, but I think is, you know, their word is worth less than it was yeah. a few years ago. And, and they're just gonna work based on their own interests. I think if we're talking about the media space, I think this element of the control over the levers of content and information dissemination is so important because what we've seen time and time again, and I've researched hundreds, probably thousands of incidents around the world over the past decade, where once the Chinese Communist Party or a company, a media outlet, an owner with close ties to the party, gains a foothold within an information dissemination channel, manipulation is going to inevitably follow. And that manipulation is not only going to be to promote the Belt and Road Initiative, it's going to be to silence and suppress people, local voices in that country, whether they're Chinese speaking or non-Chinese speaking and are critical. And it may not happen today, it may not happen tomorrow, but at some point when they both have enough clout and have enough political will, it's going to be activated. And I think that's what's so important to think about now is how do we manage, again, in a democratic way, in a way that is, you know, meets the kind of standards of transparency, of legality, of necessity, and of proportionality, protect our information networks from that kind of regime stronghold. And again, this is not, it's not a racial issue because as I said, you know, I, you know, if you have someone from Taiwan come and invest in the media, it's not a problem. But I think in a lot of countries in general, foreign influence is an issue. And some of the things that you might do, whoever's influencing, there's an element of national sovereignty and, and local freedom protection. But when it's a very economically powerful and authoritarian regime that has this track record, which I think is what gets lost when people look at this from one country to the next, right. is now there's more and more information sharing across countries is that they understand that. And I think from that perspective, this element of really mainstreaming the CCP factor, this element of really understanding the Communist Party's tactics and knowing who they are and how they're operating um, it, it is really important, both on the governmental side and the non-governmental side. Because again, when they activate it, it might not necessarily initially be on an issue that you care strongly about. It might be on something that seems kind of obscure. It might be on people who do the Falun Gong meditation practice, but are, have refugees who have gotten asylum here. Maybe you don't, that doesn't speak to you though, it should perhaps, mm. you know, or maybe it's about Muslims who have, you know, Muslim Uyghurs who have escaped China, but maybe then suddenly it's about Hong Kong and you're somebody who spent a lot of time in Hong Kong and it really, you care about it, but then it's going to get to like, we're seeing racial tensions in the United States, your own electoral choices. Um, and so I think that's where it's just, we can't deny the reality now compared to 10 or 20 years ago where China and the Chinese Communist Party, Chinese Communist Party was not an actor in our media ecosystems. It is today. And I think the more we can recognize that and take the appropriate pr protective actions, um, uh, the better off we'll be, um, you know, 10 years from now. Well, we've got about a minute or so left. Let me read to you a question that came from one of our viewers. And it reads as follows. As someone who has read some of your work and appreciate how you and Freedom House tell it like it is, I'm curious as to whether or not you have been attacked by the Chinese media and with what consequences. Okay, well, that's a good point. Well, I personally have not been yet, perhaps, um, although there have been incidents that they've pretended to be me and have tried to get information, for example, from a Uyghur group in Europe pretending to pretending to be Sarah Cook with some made up Gmail. Mm. Um, um, but Freedom House has actually been quote sanctioned by the Chinese government after the one of the first rounds of sanctions 
uh, that the U.S. did either related to officials involved in the abuses in Xinjiang or with regards to Hong Kong. Uh, China, the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs suddenly announced a set of, quote, sanctions against various human rights groups and, and democracy groups in the United States. And so Freedom House has been one of those. Um, and then subsequently, another round, actually, our president, Mike Abramowitz, was named personally. The mm. consequence at the moment is that, you know, and I don't know that any of us were getting visas anyway. None of us are planning to travel to China or, or Hong Kong, even though many of us have been many times, um, you know, but, uh, but I think that's definitely one of the potential consequences. I mean, especially with regards to the new national security law that applies in Hong Kong, it's right. extraterritorial. And the things I say here today, if I go to Hong Kong, I could be arrested and charged for them, sure. you know, just based on, on that basis. So, well, um, so I, I, mean, I think that's days. been the, you know, I think that's been the the, con the, the, the the thing, you know, I think the consequence, very minor compared to the things that Uyghur, Tibetan or Chinese people in exile who are activists and have right. family there, uh, you face. Well, Sarah Cook, thank you ever so much. We appreciate your time, your expertise, and your willing to uh, willingness to share both of it uh, with us. And so many thanks for that. At some point, uh, if that trip to Hong Kong doesn't look attractive, we'll need to get you on the campus at Notre Dame <laughs> and introduce you to our students. So on behalf of the students, faculty, and staff of the University of Notre Dame, thank you so much. Uh, it's my pleasure. Very much appreciate it. So join us on April 30th, if you will. Our topic will be the end of privacy, how intimacy became data and how to stop it. Our speaker will be Danielle Citron, a legal scholar at the University of Virginia Law School. So from South Bend, Indiana, this is Jim O'Rourke. Thank you everyone for joining us. We'll catch up with you soon. Stay well, stay safe. <laughs>